um, <laughs> getting a bit emotional. Uh, I have to go there. And then, um, it's okay. Take your time. We can pause. Come back to it. <laughs> Sorry. Hey. Charlotte Daly with Mel Sport Boxing. I'm joined by the one and only Ben Whittaker. Thank you so much for inviting us into your gym. How are you doing? All good, you know. Just finished sparring, then I'm um, a lot of talking and uh, stuff like that, but it's part of the lifestyle now. But I'm all good, thank you very much. <laughs> well, that's exactly it. Part of the lifestyle now. You have turned into this global celebrity. You've got one million followers on Instagram. But before we talk about that aspect, we want to know about Ben the Guy. All behind the scenes of this global superstar. So I guess my first question is, where did it all start? Why boxing? Um, yeah, that's a good question, really, because I would have liked to have been a footballer, if I'm being honest, but I've got two left feet. Uh, then my mum put me into ballet. I was stomping out the place, getting into trouble. So I got asked politely to, um, can you go somewhere else? Then I tried swimming. You start drowning and stuff. So I was like, what am I good at? So my dad took me down to boxing because I was a, as a little kid diagnosed with ADHD, bouncing off the walls. And I actually went down there for some discipline. But to uh, impress my dad, I signed up myself, came home and said, I'm fighting Sunday. My dad said, what? I don't think you're ready. I uh, had my first fight. Next thing you know, my dad said, you're good, we're taking this serious. <laughs> and we haven't looked back since, so it was a blessing. You said there about um, wanting to be a footballer. Now, I heard you did have a few games. A couple of red cards, I'm hearing. For, uh, uh, did you hear that? Yeah, just rumours around yeah, the block. Yeah, it must spread around, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, a couple of cup What finals. sort of trouble were you doing? What, no, what it's was just, going on? It was like, you know, you just talk a bit of rubbish to the guys. It gets a bit heated, you snap them and stuff. But I didn't know back then you had to pay for the cards. Do you know what I mean? So when we started racking up a fine, my dad said, you ain't playing no more. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah, exactly. You, know, you got to pay the subs and then fines with the red cards. So uh, we just got into boxing and uh, it's, it's been good. It, it grounded me, kept me humble. Uh, if you got out of line, you got hit with a jab in your nose and it makes you think, okay, this is serious. So it's good for kids to get into, to burn off energy and stuff like that. So it was good for me. Well, your dad had a big influence on you, but before we talk about him, you said that your mum brought you to ballet and dancing. Now, did she want you to be involved in boxing? And do you think that kind of ballet and dancing helped with your footwork and things like that in, in the ring? Something like that. You know, when I boxed, I got twinkle toes. So I got to thank the mum for putting me into ballet and dance and things like that. But honestly, when I came back and told her I was boxing, there's nothing even now she don't like it mm -hmm. you know it's changed my life and it's opened up doors for me but I don't think any mother likes to see the sun getting hit which I try not to but <laughs> yeah she didn't like it she said can't you do something else but um she saw the dedication she seen how serious I was about it so as a mother can she try to believe in me the most uh, cook my meals look after me like a mom should and uh, she got my support in different ways. So I actually went to a fight and it was one of Joe Cordina's fights and his mum was sat almost next to me and she spent the entire time looking at the ground because she couldn't watch her son in the ring being punched. Does your mum come to the fights? Can she watch you or is it a case of I'm going to watch the highlights yeah. afterwards? Yeah, <laughs> so well, um, there's one little story. Went to Liverpool in the uh, national championships and uh, I actually gave the kid a standing count. And my mum, bless her, thought it was me. And she ran up to the ring and was like crying and doing, going a bit crazy. But my dad used to be in my corner then. So my dad really couldn't do nothing but say, go back to the seat. <laughs> and then the ref actually stopped it. Then the MC came in the mic and he said, the woman with the red hair, can you please move away from the <laughs> ring? Oh, I was never so embarrassed in my life. But bless her, she got my best interest at heart. And now all she does is watch the ring walk, she might watch the first round and go, okay, I'll watch it now. Or she doesn't like the look of the opponent. She goes, oh, it looks a bit scary. She'll uh, watch the highlights when I've won. <laughs> she'll gauge it from yeah, that Yeah, she'll gauge round, it. You know, yeah. if it looks a bit scary, she'll watch after. If he looks okay-ish and uh, I land a couple of jabs from the start, she goes, oh, I'll watch it. So you said a moment ago about getting into boxing to kind of give you some discipline and um, root within your life. Now, you were working before that. I think JD Sports, wasn't it? Got sacked, am I right? Sadly. So what was the reason? You said about your ADHD diagnosis. Did you just find it hard to concentrate? Was it um, wanting to be, you know, out and about active yeah. and it was kind of pinning you down? What was the reason? Yeah, there's many things. I can't really put my finger on it. But, um, yeah, so I had two jobs. Um, I got kicked out of school, like I said, for the ADHD. I was 
I wasn't like a naughty kid, but if it was quiet, I had to do something. I had to make people laugh or something like that. Um, there was like little situations where I couldn't read the best, so to stop the embarrassment, I'd mess around, things like that, like a kid would. And then uh, my dad said, you need to do something with your boxing because you're not making money now, so try and go to JD. Went to JD, my social skills was terrible. I couldn't <laughs> really speak to people. I know you wouldn't believe it with the ring walks <laughs> and stuff, but yeah, my social skills wasn't the best. So I hid into the toilet um, over the walkie-talkie. Whitaker, where are you, where are you? Got caught on my phone, got sacked. And then my dad said, all right then, I'll get you another job. Worked at my local football team, Wolverhampton Wanderers. And funny little story, they said to me is, you can't eat in front of the fans. Right. I was like, okay, so they used to give you these meal vouchers, but you can't eat in front of the fans. So me thinking I'm clever, I said, all right then. So I used to tap my co-worker and say, it's food time. I'd go and get my little pucker pie, my Coca-Cola, and sit in the toilet and eat it. You know, not the, not the cleanest, but I had to get it done. And I got caught twice, and uh, they just said, hand me, a, hand me a jacket, that's it. Went home. Luckily enough, a week after that, I got called onto the GB team, and I was like, oh, well, you know, <laughs> God's plan, I guess, it worked out. And then I got onto the Great Britain team. They sat us down and said, one of you guys here in the next four to five years will be an Olympian. And I was one and of that guy, happened. so yeah. there you go. What was GB like? Because I know I've spoken to people before and they have very different views on it. Some people loved it. Some people didn't like it at all. Yeah. What kind of side of the fence do you sit on? Ooh, for me, it was 50-50. Firstly, um, you have to think. You're getting paid for something you do for free. You get to travel the world, meet do new people, get different stars. It's something that I'd never, never change in my life. But you have to think from a young age, you're, you're away from your family every single week. Um, you're just isolated in a house all the time. But... It's part of the journey as well. For me, I had nothing else going on in my life, so that really, really made a big difference in my life, being able to train 24-7, being able to be with a team that can help you with your nutrition, get you in a routine of running in the morning. So for me, even though it was a bit like a prison, it was kind of what I needed right there, and it was discipline in it. It changed my life. Mm. And do you think that kind of forges the mental strength that you need in boxing? The fact that you're away from your family, you're getting into the routine, it's the hard, long hours. Do you think that then that helps when you transition into the pro game where you don't necessarily have as many people forcing you or pushing you down that route? Yeah, I, I think that's kind of where people do get found out in the professional game. Since a young boy... Um, when I made the decision to become a boxer, I think discipline was the main thing for me. Um, people see my skills, but they don't really know how hard I work. And uh, on GB, you kind of mummified, if that makes sense. The coaches will get you up. They will take you to the tournaments. They will make sure the food's there. When you turn professional, it's all on yourself. And mm. some of those guys, what do I do now? I've not, not, nobody's waking me up. But then that's down to the person to say, okay... I've seen what it's like with a routine. Why can't you keep the same routine? And for me, I've got great people around me where, you know, they will push me, but at the end of the day, it's down to yourself because mm. when you're in that ring, it's you and it's the other you. guy. They can't really get in and fight for you. Yeah. So it's down to the person, but having the right structure, right discipline, right schedule, I've got everything intact right now. So I'm quite happy. You made an interesting point a moment ago about the fact because you are this showman that people don't necessarily think you're as professional or you're working as hard or yeah. all these kind of false narratives, but that's just not the case. And if I'm right in thinking, you actually missed your grandma's funeral to train for the Olympics, didn't you? Are uh, you getting all this information? <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, we went to a training camp in Turkey and uh, my, my grandma sadly passed away and I was very close to her. So um, I actually made the decision not to go, but my dad said it would be the right thing and your grandma would want you to go. So um, I had to go there, um, <laughs> getting a bit emotional. Uh, I had to go there and then... Um, <laughs> oh, it's okay, take your time. We can pause, come back to it. <laughs> Sorry. Hey. These are Sorry. the things that people don't understand that you go through and this is what's made you the success you are today. And yeah, something like that. Yeah. And hey, you, you made it into the final, you know, you got that silver yeah. medal. It's and that, that's the thing that not many people saw when I was on the podium. Why didn't he take the medals? Because of things like that, you know. I uh, miss my grandma's funeral, things like that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I've not thought about it since you said it. So when you said it, it brought the uh, emotion back. But that's part of the boxer's life. You know, you have to cut things out. 
he was sad because I watched the funeral through FaceTime. Yeah. And um, it was a hard moment, but it's what opened the door for me. Yeah, yeah. And it is clearly very hard for you. Um, and I thank you for opening up on that and speaking about it. Um, but from there, you know, your career has excelled. After the Olympics, everyone wanted a piece of the pie. Um, you went round to loads of different trainers. You were with Shane, Bomac, everyone. What made yeah. you decide to go for the team that you have? Um, yeah, the team I got well. now, I, I got I had Sugar Hill on board. Uh, we've not had him for the last two camps because uh, he's been in back-to-back camps with Tyson and things like that. But my, my, my team's quite close, really, quite small. Same team since I was a little boy. I got firstly Joe B. Clayton, who's my godfather. And a uh, story about him is when I used to go to the gym, uh, we didn't have enough money for the uh, membership. So he used to give us the membership for free. All he asked for was to turn up and put 100% in. And uh, he actually gave me my first pair of gloves. Oh. Uh, he was my dad's coach as well. And then I got my dad on board. Um, he's the, um, the strict one of the team. <laughs> you know, he still thinks I'm a little baby. Uh, like the other day, I had a bath at seven o'clock. He goes, oh, bath and bed is it? I said, bath and bed, <laughs> seven o'clock. But you know, having someone like that who's got your best interest is great. And then nutrition and strength and condition is my brother, Jamie Whitaker. And Without someone like that, I wouldn't be where I am. So I've got a good team. It's a proper family affair, this. Yeah, and then my mum, bless her. She's my little chef. Yeah. Uh, she makes the odd little cheese potato pie and banoffee pie, which I can't eat. But <laughs> as a mother does, she tries her best. So basically, your brother is getting you the abs and your mum is slowly destroying <laughs> yeah, them well, with you the banoffee pie. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes pie. you got you to put the fuel in. So the odd banoffee pie doesn't matter, but... Yeah, I have to say, Mom, we're getting closer to the fight now, so you'll have to cut it out. <laughs> yeah, rule them out. <laughs> now, like fight night is approaching, and we're all so excited to not only see you in action, but to see what you wear and how you make your way to the ring, because mm. this is something that has just taken off massively, is your ring walks, the showboating, that big word that everyone loves to talk yeah. about when it comes to you. So let's start with the kit, first of all. Whose idea is it? Who designs it? What's the vision that you go yeah. for? Um, if I'm being honest, when I was on the Olympic team, that's all I used to plan and prepare is my ring walks and kit. Because when you was on the Olympic team, it was the typical blue and red GBR on the back. It was pretty boring. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was nice to obviously wear your country's vest and represent your country. But I thought, I want to add a bit of flair. So uh, I always used to write in my notepad, first fight, I'll do this. Second fight, I'll do this. And now I've got the opportunity to do it. Um, so for this far, I've got something great planned. The Ooh. kit's already planned. The ring walk's already planned. And then all you got to do is go in there, perform. Yeah. Uh, it adds a bit more pressure, but that's what I like. In terms of the ring walk, how extravagant do you think you're going to go? Because, I mean, there's been before, who was it? Uh, George Groves coming in on like a double-decker bus. We've yeah. seen Deontay Wilder with the 40-pound costume <laughs> um, in weight. What's next for you? Um, it's, one of those <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things, I'm kind of realistic at the end of the day, I'm in fights where to the public I should be winning and stuff like that, so I don't like to go too overboard because it's like, come on now, be serious, but I still want to have that entertainment element where the fans are like, oh, he's doing something different, so it's finding that nice balance, I think when there's a world title or some sort of title on the line, that's when I can probably do a George Groves and come in on a bus <laughs> or fly to the ring, but... As I know, I try and keep the balance where it's entertainment, but not over the top. So, <laughs> okay, but okay. it is hard. It is hard when Sky they like what I do and they start saying, "Oh, would you like to come in, in a truck?" I'm like, "A truck? I'm in my fourth fight, so it is." <laughs> so fun you're like actually that. saying, "Yeah, no I'm not sometimes ideas. pulling it back because they, my fourth fight, they were talking about coming in a truck." I said, "I don't know about that," <laughs> but um, yeah, as I know, every ring walk's been good. All the kits have been quite good, so hopefully we can do one more better. Have you ever thought about having your kind of like signature colour? Because I know like Michaela yeah. Mayer, she's burgundy and yeah. that's her thing have you ever thought about something like that uh, actually i remember when we was in a new york training camp and um sugar kept going what's up with you because i was sitting there it might be the adhd i was like i kind of talk to myself and you can see that i'm talking to myself and he said what's wrong i said i'm trying to think about my kit i showed him the graph of the kit and he goes yeah it looks good but maybe change this and he said, actually, have you ever thought about having a signature colour? He said, you see the crunk colours, they was gold, red and blue. Mm. And I said, I always think about having a signature colour, but on the other hand, I've always said since a young boy, each fight like Floyd Mayweather, I want to wear different kits. Yeah. So I think that's the thing now. It's kind of a superstition. I just want to wear different kits, different colours every time because it gives a different look all the time. I was going to say, do you have any superstitions? 
Or do you try <laughs> to avoid them? Yeah, when I was a little boy, it was always lucky socks, lucky pants. <laughs> Uh, but then you got to the stage where I'm wearing the lucky pants and I'm still losing. I thought, these stupid <laughs> lucky so pants. Lucky. Yeah, these ain't so, they're probably unlucky. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And then I went through a situation where I was, okay, eat this, eat certain food. I'd eat certain food and I'd lose. I'd like, forget this damn food. So <laughs> I think if you do cut the superstitions out and just listen to your hard work, you're, you're fine. But I yeah. say the only little superstition is, is uh, I always like to pray before my fights. I always like to have a little laugh and joke, but... When I'm in the change room, I think that f- that switch flicks and all my friends say, yeah, he- he's ready. He's ready. And that's it. It's go time from there. <laughs> Somewhat like that. Well, so when you're in the ring, obviously, there's the showboating. Yeah. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Yeah. Everyone has an opinion on it regardless. But is it something you actively try to do or does it just lights are on, you're feeling it yeah. and it comes out? Yeah, I think it's lights on um, and it just comes out. Even when I spar, it, it, it happens as well. Um, there's method to the madness as well. It's called show bottom, but it's a tactic as well. Um, I don't like to give a lot away, but it is a tactic. But there's so many um, layers to my boxing. I can come forward, I can stand there and fight, I can go on the back foot, I can stay technical, and I can show bow as well. So all I'm doing right now is showing what I want to show. Uh, maybe there'll be a time in this fight where I have to show something different. That's what I'm excited about. Mm. That's what I was going to ask. Moving forward and the more you progress, do you think that that level of showbetting will continue? Is that something that is now just innate within you that you're mm-hmm. going to keep doing it regardless of who you're against? Yeah, I think there will always be a time in a fight where it will happen. But like I said, there's a, there's a game plan A, game plan B, game plan C. And I think that's what the great fighters do. They can always change or adapt to what's in front of them. And uh, that's what I do as well. As of now, it's working. It's a tactic. And like I said, there might be a pl- time where it don't work. I go, okay, that's not working. Try this. Mm. And then that works. And then I can come back to the show bowling. So that's what I'm excited to see. And that's what my career is about. It's about gradual step ups, yeah. different styles. And then when you get to the world titles, then I can really start doing it then as well. Did you ever kind of pick it up off someone else? Was it because I know obviously Prince Nassim was obviously yeah. known for that yeah. side of it. Was it from watching people like him that you thought, that's pretty cool. I want to be that sort of mm. showman. Truthfully, no, if I'm honest. Um, wh- when I w- you watch my first actual fights, I did the odd little silly little alley shuffle or whatnot, but I was actually very, very technical. But I was always out of shape. You know, I was one of those kids just turn up and fight. And then the more I enjoyed the sport, the more I watched the sport, the more I got fitter. The fights just got easy. Mm. And then I just got into a style where I'd do different things. My athleticism came out. And then out of nowhere, I'm the boxer I am now. Yeah. So it just kind of grew in me. Yeah. And I think, yeah, maybe watching a bit of anime, I became a little anime boxer in there. And that's what Got it was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think it was not the boxes, more anime supplied. I was having yeah. fun in there, trying crazy things and it works. Well, okay. Other than anime, who were your boxing idols then? If it wasn't um, Prince Nassim and yeah. people like that, who did you kind of look up to? Uh, well, I remember years and years ago, I went down for a little uh, caravan holiday down in Devon. And it was actually the year of Amir Khan's Olympics. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really like boxing, if I'm honest, but I came into the, <laughs> I came into the front room to watch um, what my dad was watching. It was breakfast time. I said, oh, what's, what are you watching? He goes, oh, Olympics. I said, oh, okay. So I looked. And uh, the fight that really caught my eye was Amir Khan's final against Mario Kindlin, a Cuban. And there was something about the Cuban style, the way he made it just look so easy, the way he hit, didn't get hit, the way he just swaggered around the ring. I thought, oh, well, that's completely different style of boxing. So I kind of stayed in touch with that, that fighter, always used to watch him on YouTube. And uh, I said that was my first idol. And then people like the Tommy Hearns, mm-hmm. Floyd Mayweather, they kind of mm-hmm. caught my uh, inspiration. Uh, actually, my favorite professional boxer before he went down the wrong path was Adrian Broner. Uh, okay. Yeah. That, so that, that might make, makes a lot that of make, sense. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And kind of finally, obviously you don't want to look past that card, yeah. but where do you see the next kind of 12 months going? Because I know you've already said you feel like you could take on Joshua Buatzi, Bruz- yeah. Dan Aziz right yeah. now sort of thing. What is your goal for the next 12 months? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's one of those things. If you don't think you can beat those guys, why be in the sport? But there is a process to this game. You know, it's little step ups, the right opponent, the right training camp. There's a lot that goes into it. But for me, the next 12 months is um, 
heading in the right direction. Of course, a winning year, some titles on the way, maybe a headline, maybe two headlines, and just get myself in a position where I am closer to those type of guys. Mm-hmm. And to finish off with a piece of news, it's obviously come out that Mike Tyson is getting back in yeah, the ring yeah. to fight Jake Paul. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, yeah, I spoke to someone else about it. It's one of those things... Uh, <laughs> Bless him. I watched one Instagram video on Mike Tyson. He's on this running machine. And he, he looks like he's got cylinder blocks on his feet. Bless him. I think he's he, he's not the fighter he used to be. But a lot of people are saying, oh, Jay Paul's bad for what he's doing. He didn't force Mike Tyson in the ring. He signed and agreed to it. Um, of course, Mike Tyson's a legend. And you don't want to see him lose to a YouTube boxer. But like I said, he hasn't been forced in there. He's agreed to it himself. So... If it makes sense to both parties, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for your time. Really excited to see you back in action, and we can't wait to follow the rest of your career. Thank you very much. Nice one.